Hi there, and welcome to this new week, this new Sunday that God has given to us. Welcome to Hope Lutheran Church. It's great to have you here. This is a Sunday that many churches, and Hope included, call Palm Sunday. It's because we remember the time that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey with palms thrown in front of him. But today we're going to take a look at one little detail that is so easy just to read right over. One single verse in this big Bible that gives us hope as we continue our sermon study that we're calling Jesus and We, where we see Jesus going through the same very issues, everyday problems that you and I go through. Today we're going to see Jesus not have the kind of day that he wanted. Do you know what that's like? You sure do. I do too. So does Jesus. Let's learn how Jesus found that he had a day that got away from him on Palm Sunday. Join us. I'd like to start out our message today by seeing a quick show of hands. Let's get our uh, arm muscles working today. How many of you guys are a fan of classical music? Classical music. You know, the, the stuff that puts some people to sleep. Some people think it is absolute brilliance. We've got about a handful. I bet it looks like about a quarter of it. I myself, I would say that um, when it comes to classical music, I'm a greatest hits kind of guy. You know, you know what that means? You know, you have bands that, oh, they'll listen to every song. But for me, that band, that singer, just give me the, the best, the best uh, greatest hits, and I've got enough. And that's how it is for me. Classical music, uh, I like it. You know, there's a time and place for it for me, for me. Um, I'm more of a greatest hits kind of guy. Um, but one of my favorites is the song Ode to Joy. If you guys know how that goes? You, I'm sure you classical people, you know how old to joy. Vicky, this is the greatest thing about having uh, someone that can play so well. Vicky, can you just play a little bit of Ode to Joy? Yeah. Good. Okay, we know that song? It's in our heads? Yeah? Oh, it's called Ode to Joy. For you classical guys out there, do you know who wrote this? Anybody know who wrote this? Beethoven, yes, Beethoven. Now, when it comes to writing classical music, my limited knowledge tells me he didn't just write that part that Vicky played for us. You have, to, you have to do the whole symphony. So we just heard one instrument give us that ode to joy. This is what it sounds like at a symphony. This is... Every piece he had to write, every part he had to work out meticulously so that we have that song that is an absolute masterpiece. So when you look at that, a song that you have heard so many times, you think that, that's pretty, pretty impressive. You know, I've heard that song, I've got a new appreciation for that song that I've heard a million times as part of your maybe greatest hits uh, classical collection. But I want to give you a little nugget of information uh, about that, that I'm betting you're going to take a look and think of that differently now. When Beethoven wrote that, he was absolutely deaf. He could never hear that song because he had no hearing. All of those sounds, all of those, that score, all of that being put together was put together by a man who did not have the ability to hear anymore. And you look at that, at least for me, and you think, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. I thought that was impressive just if you had hearing, but for a man who had to put that all in his head and have it all work out in his head and have it sound so beautiful, I'm going to look at it a different way. I hope that's one of those things I never forget. You know, especially Trivial Pursuit comes, I hope that question is brought to me because that's, that's something I hope that I never forget. Well, I bring that up because we have the same situation today in our Bible. Today we are talking about something that you are always going to hear on the Sunday before Easter. 
The Sunday before Easter is always Palm Sunday. And as a pastor, and as uh, if, if you come and listen to messages, it's going to be one of those that you pretty much know what's going to happen. You pretty much have heard it. Like Christmas, you know where we're going. Like Easter, you know what we're going to say. Like Good Friday, you've heard it before. But today I want to add on just one verse from our Bible that I think you are going to hear, once you hear it, at least it did for me, you're going to see things differently. You're going to look at this account differently like you might be looking at that Ode to Joy differently now. Because we are going to hear the last verse that I read for you in Mark chapter 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem. He went into the temple. He looked around at everything, but because it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. That verse, I'll admit, is easily lost. It's easily run over because now you start following Jesus. But I want to take a look at that today. To do that, we have to take a step back and talk just a moment or two about Palm Sunday and what's going on. Of course, Palm Sunday was prophesied, like I just said, from, uh, from Zephaniah, hundreds of years before it happened. It is when we see Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the last time, he will not be leaving there alive because he will be crucified. So he goes up there knowing full well what he's getting into, knowing that this is what it's going to take to save you and me. He went up there willingly, and he went up there humbly on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. He went in there not on a chariot, not in a stallion, not with fanfare like you would expect a king. He went in there riding on a donkey, and like we did last year, last year I had everybody stand up and show you your eye level would probably be higher than Jesus's when he was coming in. Hardly the king that you would want to have come in and defeat the Romans that are taxing you to death and have their boot on your neck, so to speak, in life. This is how Jesus rode in. So this is how it's recorded for us. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches they had cut in the fields, those who went ahead and those who uh, followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is a word that we know well. There's a, a church nearby that's named Hosanna. It's uh, the, the word that you usually hear on Palm Sunday. And it literally means save us. But it doesn't mean save us in the way that we would think, that Jesus has come to save us, save us. It means save me from these Romans. Save me from not having to go to the grocery store. Give me free food. Save me from the issues that I have in my life. Save me from disappointment. Save me and bring us back to be the earthly king that we want you to be. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Save us. Save us and do that miraculous power that you do so well and let it come onto us so that we can now be in charge of the Romans. So what they are looking for here is they are looking for an earthly king to save them. And with that, Jesus turns the corner and now it's slow moving. The people have clogged the streets. They're so excited that Jesus is going to come in and save them. He is going to be their new king, and here comes the coronation. Here comes the limousines. If we were to stand and wait for the president to go by, here he comes. He's going to flex his power, and the people were out. Remember, Jesus at this point has thousands of people following him, and the roads are clogged, and the roads are slow moving, and they are shouting things to him, that he is not going to do. He's not coming to take away the problems that we have at work. He's not coming to take away the problems that we have with other people. He's not coming to take away the fact that we've got to go to Cub Foods and to Target this week and we've got to do it again next week and the week after. He's not coming for that. He's coming to save us, to spend eternity with us. And the crowd is all around him. The roads are clogged. The people are there and everything is slow moving. Well, finally, he gets to where he wanted to go. He gets to the temple. And here is the passage that we're going to study real quickly, um, talking about it. And Jesus finally entered Jerusalem, slow moving, 
took almost the whole day to get to where he wanted to go. And then he went into the temple. It's the first place you're always going to find Jesus because that's where his father promised to dwell in a special way. And with that, he's going to spend time with his father. He's going to um, be in his father's presence, doing his father's business. This is what Jesus is all about. He is there to do the Father's will, especially when he knows what's waiting for him. Especially when he knows that arrests, that being spit upon, that being mocked, that being crucified, and asking to die would be what it took to save us. He wanted to spend time with his Father. He wanted to teach the people. He wanted to perhaps perform miracles. Well, he finally got, gets into Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple, and Mark says, and he started looking around. As you would. This is his house. He is God. He's going to look around, make a careful observation, see who is there, see what's going on. You know, this is where I was going to spend my day. Took a little lot later than I was expecting, but what do we got? What do we got going on? But because it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. In other words, because it was already late and everyone had gone home, there was nobody there anymore. He was planning to go. His plan for the day was arrive into Jerusalem, go in the temple. Perhaps I'm going to teach. Perhaps I'll preach. Perhaps I'll do miracles. Perhaps I'll spend time with the people. Perhaps I'll have all these wonderful things planned. But because it was slow moving and the roads were clogged, he couldn't get there and he lost the day. No one was here. Everyone was home. And so with that, Looks like I got nothing to do today that I wanted to do. This day, in a way, was a failure. The plans that he had with that, the crowd got in the way. The crowd got in the way and gave him the praise that he did not want. He didn't want to be their earthly king. He wasn't there for that. And yet, they were giving praise for the wrong reason and stopped him from doing the kind of day that he wanted to have. Now, notice what he didn't do. When Jesus sees that there's nobody there like he wanted, you notice he didn't stop time and reverse time and have it go back to the way he wanted. He had done that before. You look in the Old Testament and God had stopped time previously, gone back and redid it again. He easily could have done that, but he didn't do that. He didn't force people with his mind, with his hand, with just words or thoughts. He didn't force people to come into his presence. God isn't about that. He's not going to force you to worship him. He didn't condemn them either. He didn't say, you know what? <laughs> I was here to save you people. You people don't even want to hear about me. You don't even want to hear what I had to say. I'm out of here. He didn't condemn them. What he did is he trusted in God's plan. He trusted that God would take this sort of failure as a day and he would use even this to his big plan. And with that, we see Jesus putting himself right next to us. How many days a week do you say to yourself, you know what, that, that, that day got away from me? Boy, I had plans for this week, and for one reason or another, it just didn't happen. Maybe it's bigger. Maybe you're looking back on your life. Maybe you had a, a birthday recently. And you look back in your life and you say to yourself, you know what, by this age, I, I had different plans. I wasn't supposed to still be working. I wasn't still supposed to be living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I had different plans and it, it fell apart. Maybe you, by this time, would have had different relationships, better relationships with people. How is it that by this time I'm still arguing with my family about things or still, you know, feeling like I don't have friends or whatever? How am I still dealing with these things? I had different plans and those plans didn't come to fruition. Maybe it has something to do with the ministry. Maybe by this time, that neighbor that you had been inviting would have been to church by now. That uh, person, the next generation in your life, would have attended church more or lived differently. And the plans that you had didn't come true. Now, there's a couple temptations, right? There's a couple temptations that say, you know what? Well, obviously, this is God's fault. If I had money, I would be happier. If I had money, I would give more to the church. If I had more time, if God didn't make me or have me, and if he gave me a better job, I would be able to do these things. If God, you know, gave me different talents, I would be more effective. 
So maybe the first temptation when we don't see our lives, our days, our weeks, our lives turning the way we want, is to blame God. Jesus never blamed God. He trusted that God had a bigger plan. Or maybe the temptation is to say, you know what, maybe I'm like those people in the crowd. Maybe I'm in God's way. Maybe I'm not as useful as I had hoped I would have been. Maybe the dreams I have, I just now need to realize that, you know what, I'm not as, I, I, I dare not dream big anymore because they never come true. And maybe I'm not one that can reflect Jesus to other people. Maybe it's someone else because it doesn't seem to be working. And with that, we turn and we say to ourselves, maybe I'm clogging up the system here. Maybe it would be better for me just to back out. Maybe I'm as worthless and useless as sometimes I think I am. Well, Jesus never turned to the crowd and said, you guys are worthless. You guys are useless. He simply trusted in his father's plan. And so with that, I want to close just by seeing some amazing things here. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that we see Jesus dealing with the same things that you and I deal with? He had plans too. He had plans on this Sunday, and they didn't come true, just like we do. We have a Savior that knows exactly what you're going through. If you have dreams, if you have thoughts, if you thought you'd be in a different spot than where you are now, just like Jesus. You have a Savior that can relate to everything that you're going through, even when we let days get out of the way. And isn't it also amazing that Jesus pressed on? He kept going. This wasn't the day that he had expected. People clogged the streets for the wrong reasons, and yet he still made his way to that cross. To that cross so that they could be saved, so that you can be saved. So his persistence to the cross gives us that salvation. And because Jesus went to that cross, and even though the day got away, we know that we now have a new relationship with him. This is the first thing we know. If you're the kind of person that fills in the blank in your worship folder, this is what we learn. God is big enough. God is indeed big enough to use all of our disappointments to advance his kingdom. We may not understand why, but that's just how big our Lord is. Our Lord is also big enough to go to the cross, take all of our sins onto him, so that you realize that you need, don't need to perform to make God love you. You can go and reflect him because God loves you unconditionally. It also reminds us that you don't have to do things in order to be his child. Jesus did it all for you. This was part of it, going to the cross to have that relationship and make that relationship with you. Because Jesus went there, we can be faithful now with our time and our talents and our treasure and do the very best we can knowing that God will use all things for our good and for the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. Now, there are many ways that we... Hi there. I'd like to take a moment, just the two of us, to talk about what it means when you give back to God through hope and where your gifts go to. You know, this spring season, we usually have a season where we talk about the open Easter tomb and how monumental that was for human history and for your history. You notice that God didn't have the angels spread the word. He had us, we, spread the word. His people spread the word. And one of the ways he did that was to go and, and empower the people and tell the people that their Lord lives and they would go and run and tell people and tell people. Well, that was then and this is now. And I want you to know that when you give to hope, you are supporting our technology here. The same technology that you're looking and we're talking to through. This technology is what allows us to go and preach sermons and tell the news and give devotions not only to people here around Farmington, but all around the world. God has given us this technology and we use a big portion of your gifts so that we can broadcast that Jesus lives. Your Savior, their Savior lives and you help support that. Thank you to all of you that have given in the past. If you haven't given, maybe now is a time for you to give your best gift by following the information on the screen. Either way, we're just glad that we were able to spend some time together today so that we could hear the good news one more time. 
Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for supporting Hope. Thanks again for being with us today. It is always an honor to have you. If there's anything I can do for you, if I can pray for you, if I can do anything for you as you watch this, please let me know. Please get a hold of me. I'm here to serve you. Otherwise, Lord's blessings now as you enter your mission field. And always remember, because of Jesus, you have hope.